Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Melinda. On behalf of OSI committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today in OSI Online Talk Series. I hope you enjoy your lunch and ready to see the presentation from Tim Charlton. So I met this COVID-19 outbreak situation. Hope everybody doing well. Stay at home and keep physical distancing. I would like to extend my gratitude to our sponsors, Nobel Energy Resources, for funding of this Zoom platform. So with us together, already joined the, some of the FOSI committees. Masriki, our General Secretary of FOSI, uh, Pak Herman, our advisor, and the rest will joining us soon. We're glad to inform you that we established the FOSI YouTube channel. We uploaded all the videos from previous talk already. And don't forget to subscribe and like the channel and please enjoy the video. And I will try to record uh, the presentation from today's uh, station. Uh, we plan to upload it as well to YouTube. And, and get ready to be excited uh, with this special presentation on the petroleum potential of the Indonesian Banda Arc uh, with some insights from recent exploration in Timor-Leste. And now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Tim Chowton from Timor Gap, ENP. And maybe uh, some of you already know him very well, uh, met him or maybe already have his useful publications on the Abanda Arc. And later maybe hopefully Tim can, would like to share the materials and then I will share to you the participants again. And before I hand over to Tim, as a usual, please allow me to give you some rules in order to make this meeting running smoothly. I would like to get your attention for a moment. I recommend to all, all participants to mute the audio and switch off your video during explanation from presenter to maintain good connection. And the presentation may be recorded for screening within the FOSI platforms and by the permission from Team Charlton later on. A Q&A box can be found in the icon panel, usually at the bottom of your screen. Enter your name for the committee to collect after the presentation. It will be answered live, but it might turn on your audio and video to deliver your question. And let's see how it goes. If so many questions raise up, uh, we can have a break for a moment uh, in the middle of your presentation, and we'll let them to answer the question. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please enjoy the talk and please welcome Tim Charlton. Tim, well, now is your turn. Yes, thank you, Melinda. Um, well, greetings, from, good morning from um, UK. Good afternoon, everybody in Jakarta and areas, and good evening to uh, people in um, uh, East Timor and Australia. Uh, I hope you can see that screen okay. Uh, if not, somebody let me know. But if it's looking okay, then we'll move on. Um, so yeah, so this is the title of my talk, uh, talking about the petroleum potential, particularly the Indonesian Banda Arc. But because we've been working recently and exploring in Timor Leste, obviously the same geology. So um, some suggestions of things that we found uh, particularly useful um, when exploring East Timor. So for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've been working in, um, well, I started working first in Timor in 1983, that's 37 years ago, a long time ago now. Um, so I was studying the Colbano area in the south of uh, West Timor. Um, then between 1987 and 89, I did postdoctoral studies in the um, London University group, uh, firstly working in the Cape and Tanambar Islands in the Eastern Banda Art with Tony Barber, and then in Robert Hall's group working in Northeast Indonesia. Since, well, between 1990 and 2000, I was a regional uh, geologist uh, combining uh, oil industry studies with ongoing academic studies of the Eastern Indonesia region. Then in 2000, uh, just immediately after the restoration of independence in East Timor, I uh, think I was probably the first foreign geologist into the country and uh, I've been concentrating mostly on Timor Leste geology since that time. <coughs> mostly again um, consultancy projects and general academic studies. 
But then since, well, in 2016, I took my uh, first ever um, uh, regular employed job uh, working at the age of 58. I started my career working for um, as geoscience advisor to Timor Gap, the national company of Timor Leste, um, uh, advising their onshore exploration program. Uh, so, I'm sorry, sorry for, for interruption. Uh, can you please put aside your participant list window? It's blocking your presentation slide. Um, yeah, the participant list window on your screens. Can you put it aside because it's blocking the... Ah, yeah, there, okay. Is yeah. better? Uh, can I get... Can I? Yeah, because it's blocking the presentation slide. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sorry. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you, um, you. Okay, no problem. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is just a brief outline of what I want to cover today. So a few introductory slides, then a history of petroleum exploration in the Bandarat, only surround West Timor and Timor-Leste. I'd love to talk about uh, Tanambar and Kay as well, but there just isn't time to do it today. Then uh, just a few sort of discussion topics of how knowledge of the Indonesian Bandarat has helped us in exploring in Timor-Leste. And then, in return, how some suggestions of how work we've done in TWLS can help with um, future exploration in the Indonesian Bandarat. So, uh, regional setting, um, of course, I don't need to uh, tell you all about uh, the regional setting of the Bandarat, but uh, so the Bandarat, particularly the Bandarat arc from Sumba, Timor, Tanimar Islands, Kay Islands, Seram, and Buru. So, the four arc of the Bandar Arc is the zone of collision between the Indonesian island arcs and the northwest continental margin of Australia. Um, the fold and thrust belt essentially pushing the um, distal margin of Australia back onto the uh, more proximal parts of the Australian continental margin. To a greater or lesser extent, um, there is also remnants of the pre-collisional fore arc, what in Timor we call the Alokthon, um, bits of the Bandar arc thrust over the Australian sequences. Now, anybody who knows the work I've been doing recently will know that uh, that is really my uh, main academic um, interest at the moment is the Bandar arc. But as this is a uh, sedimentologists and petroleum people, I'm not going to talk too much about the, uh, the, the Alokthon problem in Timor, except just right at the end where it, because it does have uh, definite um, implications for um, oil exploration in Timor and presumably Saram as well by, uh, by, um, by comparison. So anyway, um, obviously uh, in terms of petroleum, the northwest shelf of Australia to the south of Timor is a major petroleum province and to Palaburung to the north of uh, Saram with the Bintudi and Salawati oil fields, um, major provinces. And then, of course, in Seram Island as well, commercial oil fields at uh, uh, Bula and Nossail and the recently discovered gas field at Lofin. Now, uh, Audi Charles, many years ago, described uh, Seram as a mirror image of um, Timor across the band of sea. And that's exactly, yeah, I, I entirely agree with that and I'd lo love to uh, prove up the uh, the mirror image similarity by finding some oil in Timor as well. So this next slide um, shows the main um, oil indications around the Bandar Arc, oil seeps in green, gas seeps in red and mud volcanoes in orange. <coughs> and for those of you, well, there's, you see, there's, a few, there's, there's, a, there's oil, the oil seeps in Saram, but many more in, in Timor. And there's also a good number of um, particularly mud volcanoes in the Tanimbar and Kao Islands. So very sort of uh, good regional indications of prospectivity. So for those of you who've never seen a gas... Oil seeps as well. This is an oil seep. This is my. Uh, <laughs> 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 
draining for some time so I'll just get rid of that but you see now he's separating off the oil um, and Dino's uh, collecting it to send off to uh, well this one went off and eventually to um, Andy Livesey in, 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 in Jakarta um, so that's the oil and gas heaps mud volcanoes as well I don't uh, have a picture of an Indonesian mud volcano but this is a very similar one from Azerbaijan exploding and they are they they just occasionally very occasionally they have huge gas explosions. <laughs> I wasn't wasn't in my head that noise. <laughs> um, so this is this is one of Azerbaijan exploding with a huge amount of uh, gas er, er, burning gas erupting, and very similar ones and all around the Bandara. As I was told by local people in Timor that um, during the Indonesian times. Uh, one of these exploded right next to an army camp and the soldiers thought they were being attacked by guerrillas with really large explosions. Anyway, so um, the stratigraphy of the Bandar Arc is, you see on the, one, the figure on the left, um, very similar stratigraphy uh, around the arc from Timor to Tanimbar to Saran. The, the sedimentary cover starting in the Permian, certainly in Timor and Tanimbar and probably in Saram as well. Um, the Triassic is particularly important for oil exploration. Um, remember particularly the Mano Sailor limestone, which we'll be talking about later in Saram. The main reservoir documents as well with the plastic input and um, the, uh, this includes the source rocks in, uh, in both uh, Timor and probably also in, sorry, in Saram and probably also in Timor. Then in the Jurassic, you've got mainly shales, which obviously form a seal above the uh, these limestones in particular. And then in the Cretaceous and Tertiary, which is obviously after the initiation of the uh, Indian Ocean, and um, so break up, continental break up, and then this, the, uh, the Bandar Arc area came to occupy the um, outer edge of the uh, Australian continent, so a very distal continent. Um, in Timor, mentioned again for later reference, the, this is usually called the Colbano group, and in the equivalent in Saram is the Neef group. So that's uh, around the arc. Um, away from the arc, so from Timor to the, towards Australia, you see you go from distal to proximal, and similarly in Saram, you go from distal in Saram to, to proximal. In, Okay, so let's uh, start looking at the exploration history of Saram. Um, there are essentially three uh, oil fields or oil, commercial oil discoveries. There's the Bula fields on, on the coast up here in the northeast of the island. Then there's Osail about 10 kilometers inland. And the recently discovered, um, not that recent now, Lofin um, to the west. So we start with um, Bula, which was the well, the, the geological map of the Bula area, with Bula up on the coast here and an sail in inland. The brown is the um, the uh, the Triassic um, plastic units, the Kanike formation, and then the uh, the, the, the grey is the Malonge unit, and um, the, the base of all the, the sedimentary post-orogenic and orogenic sediments along the coastline. Now the Bula field is up here on the coast. Um, you see these green symbols indicating oil seeps, um, which were first reported in 1865, at least reported to the outside world, to the, well, should we say them, say at this stage anyway, to the, um, to the Dutch, <laughs> should we say. Um, so this is the first sort of report uh, internationally of these oil seeps. This, by the way, on the right, is a Google Earth image of um, Bula, area and you see these piers which were where some of them will show another photo in a while this is where some of the wells are located out in the bay and i presume i haven't been there but i presume that all these little roads down here that's just come to a dead end i presume each one of these 
has a nodding donkey and uh, a, a truck comes along every now and again and collects the oil. I say, I, I, don't, I haven't been there, I don't know, but it, that's just my guess from how it looks um, on Google Earth. Uh, so 1865 oil was reported, 1897 the first drilling and they found oil very shallow, only drilling to less than 250 meters or so and not very f rapid uh, production that they're producing, that they're getting 200 barrels per day. Then another continuing phase up until 2000, uh, 1913 when they, they drilled another nine wells, three of them found oil. And then in 1913 it was taken over or whether they were, the companies were subsidiaries already of Patafsh, Petroleum Motspaki, I have so apologies for my Dutch pronunciation, but Shell to make it simple. Um, so they brought um, the field into production in 1913. And up until the Second World War, they drilled 128 wells, 88 producing wells, all very shallow. Um, they also discovered in 1930 an extension, an offshore extension coming out into the bay called Le Monde. Um, and then, so by 1941, there were 55 producing wells with a cumulative production of 8 million barrels. Um, then obviously World War II, as the Dutch left, they destroyed, destroyed the wellheads. Um, uh, but then in the next three years, the Japanese um, drilled six new wells and they fit, repaired 15 wells and they uh, produced something like 200,000 barrels of oil. And then of course, at the end of the war, it was uh, destroyed again. This time, I, I don't know whether the Japanese um, destroyed it themselves or whether it's, this is this picture down at the bottom right here is uh, a picture from a bombing raid um, during the time. And you can see these piers coming out into the bay, these, these piers out here, presumably. And you can see the bombs exploding near to the wellheads. So by the end of the war, anyway, um, the field was out of action. And then through the Indonesian uh, period of uh, <coughs> early independence, there was nothing uh, happening on Bula until 1969, when a new Seram PSC was awarded to Gulf and Western. Uh, they brought the field back into production in 1970. Then they discovered a new, um, a, a new extension of the field called Bula Tenggara. We'll see in a minute. Um, and then in, I think it was 1999, um, the and a small block around, small PSC block around Bula was um, awarded to Calrez, and it was later, later taken over by South Sea Petroleum Holdings. Um, so up to the present, it's produced about uh, 20 million barrels, um, not very much, over 100 years, averaging about 300 barrels per day. Not very much to say, slow but steady, but um, if we could find something like that in Timor, I think that would be very useful for the Timorese economy. Present status on the Bula field, I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 if anybody has any more information, I haven't been able to find it. It looks like maybe it's reaching the end of its life. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about what's happening now. I haven't looked at it for a few years. So let's look at the geology a bit. Um, this map on the left in the red is the Bula field. Um, so this is a, a, an isopack map of um, the, the field, uh, the top reservoir, I guess. Um, and you can see it's very shallow. This is 90 meters, 90 meters um, depth and just deepening. In the, and then, so there's this sort of anticlinal ridge along here. Um, so in very shallow sediments, so this is this the slide of section down here shows it at natural scale. You can see it just seems to be just this sort of gentle rollover, very shallow, gentle hanging wall of a extension or anticline. It's also divided, as I say, into the, well down here these are Pleistocene plastic sediments, and up here Pleistocene carbonate sediments. A bit of a reef up here, and the the, the oil field extends up here. So this is Bula. And this is Le Monde. And then Bula Tengara in blue down here. This is, well, this is rather different, but this is actually located, this is the Sinorogenic Basin up here with a normal fault margin. And Bula Tengara seems to be located below the um, below the uh, basin, in the in the fault thrust fault, really. And the reservoir is in, in Triassic sandstones and the Kaniki Formation. 
There's another little field, Bula Iron, somewhere up here, but um, I haven't been able to find any information. So again, if anybody has anything they can pass on to me, I'd be very interested to know about it. But what is what what what, what it is really? So that was the uh, first field discovered, Bula, right on the coast, just drilling. It's a, it's a theme that I, I want to sort of develop is to how important drilling near oil seeps is. So these are this first Bula um, was discovered just by drilling blind next to the oil seeps. Of course, there's another group of oil seeps down here in the Neef um, area. Um, and of course, the Dutch also uh, shell, butaft, whatever, petroleum moss, which he drilled um, some oil wells down here. So they, First ones was the Neef oil pool down here in the 1930s. They, they got a couple of hundred or a few hundred barrels of oil from here, from five wells. And then a bit later in 1921, they drilled Bellion oil pool and got a few tens of thousand barrels of oil, but uh, nothing very significant. And it wasn't until 1985 when Kufpek uh, farmed into the uh, area to explore for deep, with the aim of exploring for deeper oil in Sarau. So the first two wells were Bolifar and Utara out here, which did find uh, sub-commercial oil in the Tricic Manusela formation. And then also East Neef down here, which was the same sub-commercial oil. Then the important discovery was Osseo one up here. Um, these purple outlines indicate the, well, the Osseo and uh, Neef fields in this area through here. So Osseo one was here. And then we confirmed a few later, years later with Osseo 2 up here and Osseo 4 here. This was brought into production in, and uh, currently it's producing about 2,000 barrels a day and it's already produced uh, 18 million barrels in the 20 or so years that it's been active. So this is a bit more look at the geology. This is a um, uh, uh, depth map of um, the um, Osseo field so along here you see it's on, along a structural ridge now whether that's an anticline or whether it was a sedimentary uh, sedimentary buildup in, of Triassic limestone I'm not quite sure um, I, my guess is it's probably more of a sedimentary structure that's been uplifted subsequently as a block um, <coughs> so the so to say the reservoir is the Triassic Manosela formation, Triassic Jurassic. Talk about the age of the Manosela formation later. It's one of the things I'll discuss later. Um, the seal is Jurassic shales, the Kola shale overlying it. And uh, as studies by Peter et al. Um, shown that the source rock is anoxic marine carbonate. So the contemporaneous limestones or of deeper water restricted marine limestones um, alongside the Refall or um, <coughs> shallow marine, at least limestones of the of the um, Kanike formation. These are a few cross sections uh, across and along um, the Osseo field. You see this, this type of structure beneath. This is what we call the thin skin fold and thrust belt. There's no um, this, these big thrust sheets. Um, this line is along the crest of the structure. You can see. The big thrusts, so, and this is over. This is, so this is the Neef group, the um, Cretaceous Paleogene mostly units in here, and then over thrust by the uh, Kaniki formation, which is thrust over the top of everything in this area. Um, the actual top of the reservoir is, is you see, it's almost horizontal uh, along. Uh, it's not not thrusted like the um, the fold belt above it. It's much simpler structures, just reverse faults probably, um, steep reverse faults rather than low angle thrusts. And you can see it again in this seismic line. This is uh, across the structure, as you can see, showing the um, fold and thrust belt structures here, thin skinned fold and thrust belt structures, but the much more coherent structure at the top of the man of sailor underneath. So the next one discovered uh, was the Lothi gas field. Um, interestingly, again, although it's mainly a seismic based discovery, they did actually report oil seeps from this area, which I, 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 I think is very interesting. But they, they were, even for this very deep structure, they, are, they did find some local oil seeps. So Lofting was, as I say, it was based on uh, interpretation of the seismic 
grid and um, the, the, the one discovery well, uh, Lothian one, found 160 meters of gas uh, in here. And then the second one, Lothian two, carried on drilling deeper and they got 1300 meters of gas. So this is a huge um, and very deep structure. You can see the TD here, 5,000, nearly 5,700 meters. This must be one of the deepest wells ever drilled in Indonesia, I should imagine. Very deep structure, but a nice symbol. Again, to me, that looks more like a sedimentary buildup rather than a, um, with a structural feature. Um, so probably below the fold and thrust belt. So this is um, a cross section of Saram where I lifted from the Lion Energy website, a small Australian company, but they have the uh, they're the operators of uh, a new block that uh, is uh, mostly well the new exploration acreage across central S Saram really or central eastern Saram, um, <coughs> and they're also minor partners in um, in Osail and Lofin. And um, this, this is their cross section, which I, I, I think is very um, well, like the type of thing we're seeing in Timor. Um, just to put, I put a few notes here to remind me what to say at the time. So, Osail and Lofin seem to be below the thin skin fold thrust belt. You see, the thin skin fold thrust belt are the shallow or, or near horizontal thrusts, compared with these, which we call uh, thick skin structures, which are uh, probably. Uh, cutting into basement, and this is uplifting structures beneath the thin skin fold and thrust belt. It's a much more coherent geology, so just all Triassic, um, for instance, along here, and, but then over the top, obviously, much more complicated geology thrust over the top. So, on this on this section from, they've yeah, got the Kanike formation up here, the uh, Triassic basin. They're also interpreting Kanike formation and the, I think that's probably may, maybe incorrect. Um, I suspect that this will be basement under here or, or, or maybe Permian sediments, Paleozoic sediments, but I don't think it'll be um, the, the same Kanike formation under these units. You see the same sort of limestone and Timor probably sitting directly on um, metamorphic uh, basement. But, uh, so I expect this to be um, not uh, Triassic basal sediments as it's indicated on here, but I, I doubt that they've ever drilled deep enough to get into this, to find out what this actually is down here yet. And I uh, just want to emphasize this big overthrust of the Kanike formation in here, because it's very similar to what we're seeing in Timor, particularly in the more internal parts of the island. Okay, just to summarize, uh, just very briefly, but uh, maybe for record later. Um, so three commercial discoveries, Bula in the Synorogenic Basin, Osail in the um, well, sub-thrusted version of declines, and Lofin the same. Um, reservoir has proved on the uh, Pleistocene sediments, um, which is a good analog for Timor, but also in Triassic plastic sediments and plastic, um, Triassic carbonate sediments. So various reservoirs, Jurassic shale seals, uh, particularly for the Triassic reservoirs, and uh, Triassic Jurassic source for the oils. Um, yes, I think that's all I need to say there. Okay, so moving on to um, West Timor. Um, this is on the right as a, a map of uh, the main oil indications again the oil seeps, the gas seeps, and the mud volcanoes, and various block outlines, and the wells, various wells drilled. Uh, in, in Timor. So obviously there was a bit of research before World War II but we don't really have any useful records from that. I think they were actively exploring at the start of World War II and they had to, and they lost all their samples and reports when they, uh, when they um, had to be evacuated quickly at the end, at the beginning of the Second World War, the Dutch geologists. Um, PSC after in Indonesian independence was awarded in 1968, which is interesting. We just before um, before Bula was reactivated in, in Saram. So the company whose award it was called International Oils. They were actually a sister company of the contemporaneous company exploring uh, East Timor. 
time. Um, they denied it for uh, political purposes. Um, but uh, in, so they, they had this area here and carried out early exploration. Then in 1973, Woodside and Burma, big, well, relatively big Australian oil companies, uh, farmed into both East Timor and West Timor, or Portuguese Timor as it was then, um, and West Timor, um, and took over operatorship. They drilled a well, Savu One, which is the next one of the islands just over to the uh, west of Timor. Um, they had pretty much all of the onshore area and the islands um, to the west. Um, but uh, Savu One well was pretty useless. And uh, and then, of course, in 1976, the uh, start of problems in Indonesia, uh, uh, in uh, the end of the era in Portuguese Timor. Um, and the um, so, um, the but the Timor PSC was relinquished in 1976. <coughs> a new PSC, the SOA PSC, which is outlined in this green uh, line here, most of uh, most of West Timor and a little way offshore to the south. They were, I was awarded to Amasis. Uh They did obviously lots of uh, exploration work, field work, and uh, offshore seismic um, and various uh, onshore. Uh, geophysical studies ending in the drilling of or culminating in the drilling of Banley one down here on near to the south coast in 1983 1993 94. But then after drilling that, uh, then during the late 1990s, there was a, a block, uh, the Timor PSC, which also could tiny bits of West Timor. Again, this is a period I know nothing about, so I'd be interested to hear if any um, any Indonesians have any um, knowledge they could feed back to me. I'm just interested in the history of exploration. So if there was anything interesting happened to them, I'd be very interested to hear, but nothing to say from that for this. Then in 2008, um, he and I were awarded this West Timor PSC down here. This is so incorporating the Colbano area in the south of West Timor and the offshore area to the south. They've shot some in the early days. They shot a grid of seismic lines in the Colbano area, um, and obviously offshore seismic lines. Um, but again, I haven't heard anything from them for a long time. They never got around to drilling anything so yet. Anyway, um, I presume I'm not even sure whether the PSC is still active or what's happening there. So again, request for more information from anybody who has it. So this is just a couple of slides about the Colbano area in the south of um, West Timor. Uh, as I've said earlier, this is actually my PhD study area, so a great favorite of mine. Um, what was interesting before the start, this is a Google Earth image, obviously, but um, International Oil, who was studying this area in the late 1960s, early 1970s, you can see, hope going up in the uh, the west southwest of the Colbano area. It looks like some sort of, they thought when they saw it on the aerial photos, they thought it was an anticline. But when they went there to look at it, it's actually a thin skin fold and thrust belt of the imbricated Colbano group, the Cretaceous uh, tertiary sediments, stacked up by thrusting. And then it's, this structure has been superimposed on it. And to be honest, when I did my PhD, I didn't really get a good picture of why, why this was looking like. It wasn't until um, Amasis published this, uh, an image of this seismic line offshore, this line 9185, which comes down parallel to the coast. But because of the swing of the structures in the Colbano area, this line of seismic is, could equally be a line like this through the Colbano area. And this is at the bottom is a sketch of the um, of this seismic line. And you can see this uplift here, which would be equivalent to the Colbano Mountains onshore. And you can see it's underlain by this, what we call an inversion anticline, a thick skinned inversion anticline. And so this is, this is down here. So you can quite easily picture that the reason why this is like this is because potentially there's a big anticline under here as well. So um, this is very, this is finally, Maybe gave me some understanding of what was happening in the, the big picture of the Colbano area about 10 years too late for me. So, Banley 1 was drilled here, and this is 
the badly wound well column. Um, it drilled through this complex fold and thrust belt, re big repeats of um, Cretaceous and tertiary. Then below that, it becomes much simpler. You have late Jurassic rocks down here, then you have the shale, um, the Wailuli formation, early middle Jurassic. And then below that, even simpler, this is very simple geology. It stopped, starts dipping up 18 degrees to the southeast, and as you go down hole, it just gets shallower and shallower, four degrees dip, very regular dips to the southeast. And it seems like it was drilled, this is my interpretation anyway, it was drilled on the uh, flank of an anticline. So the rock's dipping off to the southeast down this way, and so there's a, an anticline somewhere up here to the north. And as well, they, they got good well, oil, oil and gas seeps down here and down here. So it's quite possible that there's a big, simple anticlinal structure down here. But unfortunately, as I say, um, um, uh, the, 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 the Amundsen's abandoned the block after this. Well, I, th I think it's a shame because it, they found something interesting, I'm sure. And um, well, anyway, so far, um, he and I haven't drilled it either. But offshore, um, the offshore seismic collected by, well, either by or for um, ENI, um, came up with this structure, um, structure, and it's a, to me, it's an absolute classic um, inversion anticline. Is it over the top, you've got this simple fold and thrust belt, well, sorry, a complex fold and thrust belt over the top, but underneath it, a big, simple anticline. Um, this is on the seismic. And um, he and I also did this uh, magnetic profile, which came up with the same um, same structure. Um, so a big, simple anticline. I, I don't, I, there must be some reason why they haven't drilled it. I don't know. It looks looks a very very promising structure to me. Okay, so let's now um, move on. A quick summary of the uh, history of exploration in uh, East Timor, Timor Leste. Portuguese Timor as it was before 1976. So three main areas, so the Polaraca area in the centre of the island, the Alimbata area in the east of the island, and the Suai area in the southwest. So starting with um, Polaraca, this is it's just one valley, this is where um, that oil seep I showed being sampled early was from, probably from this, it's this pool down here. Um, these guys are bailing out oil from the um, from a, from a hole in the in the floor of the river, and you can see down here some of the oil they produce today. They can produce produce up to um, about um, <coughs> five on a very good day. They can produce as much as five barrels of oil. Um, so history of it: the, the oils first again reported to the Portuguese at least. Um, obviously, local people knew about it plenty of time earlier, but reported to the Portuguese in 1884, or they were using it by then anyway. Uh, a concession was granted to a Portuguese guy from Hong Kong in 1890. Then 1892, uh, a geologist, an engineer came along 170 gallons of oil from, from these seeps. And they were analysed by, by an early geochemist, um, quite a well-known figure in the early oil industry, who described them as of remarkably high quality. The first well at Puerlaca was attempted in 1898, but it's very shallow and not, um, and several other shallow wells were drilled. The deepest was to 58.5 meters. A common theme at this time was it was actually quite active exploration at this time in various areas in 1911, 1912, but there was a, uh, an uprising by the Timorese called the Boaventura Rebellion. And this pretty much killed off this First exploration phase. Um, all the uh, all the drillers abandoned the area and escaped from the uh, uprising. So then, of course, there's World War, and then um, uh, no, nobody actually came back here. But uh, there was a small refinery established, um, just using the, the the seeps, and they were producing about twenty five thousand liters per month of oil um, up until nineteen seventy six. Alimbata, the eastern area, is really quite spectacular for the amount of oil that's seeping from the ground there. Um, there's this, this one is on the coast, and um, you can see the oil on, on the uh, 
in amongst the reef at low tide. And at very low tide, you can actually collect oil very easily just as it oozes out of the reef. There's also a big burning gas seat at some point. And barbecue pit, you see they built a sort of brickwork around the gas seat. And this is just, this was permanently built, burning up until a few years ago. Um, in 1925, one of the uh, exploring companies, as a, as a sort of publicity stunt, they came and collected a 20 ton sample of oil. This is them taking it away back to Australia to, to impress the investors. And he, this, this guy, Manderson, he dug um, 25 pits on the, on, the, on the shore, and each one of them just filled up with water with oil in it. Uh, very impressive. And he went around just digging holes into the ground on, on the, um, on the uh, uh, coastal plain. And they could just, each one of them, you could just put, get burning gas out of very easily. So, as you said, the, 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 the beach front, front of um, this place literally drenched in oil. So, this is more of the history of it. So, this is down at the bottom, by the way, is from that 1925 period of uh, advertising saying the greatest discovery ever made for oil in Australian investment. And just uh, obviously uh, pushing for money at that time, and they got enough money to drill some well. So, um, in, well, anyway, back in first well drilled was in 1910, 1911. It found oil at 84 meters depth. Another one in 1911 found. They started another well, but that was interrupted by that Boa Ventura re rebellion. 1914, another well. Again, they found oil a couple of time places, a couple of levels. And it actually blew out on several occasions, with you know, quite explosive um, release of oil and gas. So then, in the 19, after this um, fundraising in 1925, <coughs> they started another well. Um, very, th th this took about two years to drill to about 273 meters. They found oil, uh, but, but again, but only at shallow levels, and they started an. But the main decision was to be malaria related, um, and that pretty much killed off that phase of exploration uh, together with the, uh, the worldwide uh, economic collapse in the 1920s. Um, so, oil, after World War II, as I say, Timor was founded in 1955, and their first well was again in this area, Alien Bata 1. Again, it found oil at shallow levels, but nothing deeper. So. So this is a well. This is a, a a geological map that Dino Gandara and I made very quickly in uh, about 1911. Uh, 2011. Um, quick sketch map um, this, uh, of the Alimba area. You can see gas seeps here and here, oil seeps here, here and here. So why has no commercial oil been found? These seven wells have been minimum of seven wells have been drilled, and they all found oil but only less than 100 metres depth. So I think what is particularly important is this outcrop on the coast. You can see this thrust here. It's a northern dipping thrust. So I think that all, all the oil is migrating up the thrust plane. And actually the prospectivity, prospectivity is to the north, up, up in this area, up to the north of Valley Marta. Um, this is my most recent um, <coughs> cross-section of the area, but sort of indicates um, how we were sort of developing the idea of where the oil might be in, in this area. This is one of the areas that's um, uh, sort of commercially, uh, currently being um, uh, touted by the Indonesian uh, Timorese authorities for uh, licensing next year. So I think it's a, a nice area. So my area down in the southwest of uh, Timor West, um, so this again has oil and gas seeps. Um, and in 1910, the first concession was awarded again to a Hong Kong group um, over these seeps at Matai and Waimara. This is the Matai seep, the top picture. Um, you can see this guy standing on a sandstone horizon integrated with shales and another one here, two sandstone horizons. And they've got oil, they're dipping into the, uh, into but the oil is just migrating up to the surface and coming out along these. This is not uh, a bottle of coke he's holding, that's actually oil which we collected from a 
and that probably presumably another sandstone rib that comes out of the river bottom just below this picture. So very good quality oil again coming out of um, that time. Uh, this is wine marrow, which is a bit more swampy. You can see the puddles of oil on the surface. So the first well was drilled actually in this wine marrow area in um, 1911 12, but again, it was again. Uh, drilling started again in 1920, but it had to be abandoned because of star illness, and uh, that was the end of that phase. During the Second World War, the Japanese were recovering more than 100 barrels per month from pit, pits at, dug at this locality in that time. So then the history of uh, Timor oil from 1956 to 1976. So firstly, as I say, they, they drilled at um, Alimbata, got a few oil shares, but nothing very much. Then they drilled, drilled again, near, not far from Alimbata, they drilled two wells at Osulari, but they weren't any success. Then their focus shifted to the Suai area uh, from about 1959. And in 1960, they started a drilling program this is a geological map I've redrawn, but from the, from the time of um, um, from the time of um, the, when they commenced drilling, it's pretty similar to um, to the um, Bula Basin in in, um, in Ceramic Sea as a, a boundary fault, and then the, these units in green are the VKK formation, which are interbedded players player players to see sandstones and shales, turbidity sandstones and shales. They would be the main reservoir target. Um, and then there are also limestones up here, reefal limestones, um, which are really reefal limestones. So a very similar set setup to um, uh, Bula. And they, again, they've, got, they, they've mapped out this um, uh, anticline, matai anticline, uh, parallel with the boundary of the um, <coughs> basin, which is again similar to, um, uh, to, to Bula. Um, and so they drilled these six Matai wells. Um, the first four were all drilled in this area down here, near where they interpreted the crest of the Matai and declined to go. Um, the first well found oil at uh, 250 metres. So they drilled an immediate follow up um, much more carefully um, and uh, uh, they, they recovered oil. They recovered. Um, one and a half barrels of oil in 20 minutes, which they extrapolated to a rate of 110 barrels per day. But actually, it was probably falling off fairly rapidly, and so it was only a little small accumulation. But they drilled, drilled two more wells, three and four, all in the same area, followed up and found again minor oil. Then they were a bit more adventurous and they moved. Matai 5 was drilled somewhere down here, um, out into the basin, which makes sense, but as I'll show. Um, Later, they probably moved too far. And then Matai 6 up here, they drilled, drilled on the, what they thought was the crest of the anticline up here, and they were losing faith by them. They didn't even bother to put a, a geologist on this rig, so we didn't know too much about this, this well. Um, but they didn't find any, any significance. So just looking at the four Matai wells, so up here at the surface would be this VKK formation. And that's probably, well, one of the things they were probably targeting. Um, but then they went very quickly into the Bobonara complex, the Melange, and which is where they found oil, probably in blocks in the Melange. And three of that of the four wells actually then went into basement, well, into the Lolotoy complex, the metamorphic complex, at depths of about 400 meters. And they kept trying, they tried to drill through it, thinking maybe it was a block in the um, in the Melange, but no, it was, it was real solid uh, metamorphic uh, complex underneath very shallow dips beneath Matai. So that was 62, they'd finished that drilling program and then they uh, retreated for a bit and obviously saved up 1968 and um, acquired a seismic grid, uh, particularly around uh, the Suai area, onshore and offshore, um, in 68 to 70. Um, this, a uh, couple of the onshore seismic lines, if you can see this small map here, so Suai towns up here, and this is the coastline. Um, and there are these two parallel lines here, I and J, and then it's offshore uh, extension uh, on this line, Q, 
I've shown just the sort of structure that we're seeing from the seismic, or I've now at least interpreted from their seismic lines. Um, but the first two wells were actually drilled right down here, well out into the basin, almost as far out into the basin as you can go on shore. And they found a Cape Tafara and Tafara 1, or Tafara, sorry, Tafara, Cape Tafara 1 and Tafara East 1. They found um, good thick sections, hundreds, nearly, well, more than a kilometre, nearly two kilometres of um, uh, VKK formation, good reservoir quality, but no oils, no hydrocarbons encountered, probably no structure. Then the next two wells, they went back into that Matai area and drilled two more wells just a bit further to the west, but they found absolutely nothing and they were abandoned very quickly. So I one and two were drilled or down in this area here. Um, they did find, they tested, they did find minor hydrocarbons, but nothing very significant. The final three wells, though, Suai Loro one and two, and Kotatasi one, to put drill down in this area, so down on this, um, you know, as, as near to the culmination of the structures that you get onshore. And this is the wellhead of um, Suai Loro one. You could still collect very nice uh, liquid oil from in here, um, low, uh, well, high API uh, oil, um, very, uh, and also this, this well had Cotatasi, which has now been cleaned up for environmental reasons. But you can see it used to sit in a big puddle of uh, rather thick oil. This is a, this 25 API oil at Cotatasi, which is down here. Um, this is the most pr productive. Uh, uh, they got nine barrels per hour from that, which I think is about 220 barrels per day uh, rate, but it wasn't just to be commercial and it probably wasn't. But uh, so that was the, um, that was pretty much the end of um, Timor Oil's exploration. Um, they, they, so, um, they, they tried an offshore well, um, but I won't talk about that, called Mola. Um, but that was also the, the that was given up on at, uh, in 1976 at the time of the Indonesian entry into uh, Portuguese Timor. So then, well, then I, then I say I, I started working in Timor in 2000, and by 2015, Dino Gandara and I had compiled this geological map of the Suai area, um, and um, so. Just to show you the sort of setup of the geology of the Suai area, there's the Sinorogenic Basin down here on the coast. Then you have a area of Mesozoic, Pelmo Mesozoic, Holm Thrust Belt sediments. And then to the north of this, you have this Volatoy Metamorphic Complex. And if you construct all the wells in this fence diagram, all, all the wells that were drilled by Timor, you get exactly the same setup. You've got the, the um, Sinorogenic Basin below that. What the drillers called the Bobonaro complex, uh, the Bobonaro um, scaling clay, but it's probably just um, drilling through a complex fold and thrust belt. And then below that, you have the Lolotoy complex, right down out here, getting very deep. So the Lolotoy complex extends from here, and it dips right under, at least out as far as here. So that was the setup before 2016. So, in 2000, well, December 2015, the uh, Timor-Leste government awarded uh, exclusive exploration rights to an onshore block to Timor Gap, the national oil company of Timor-Leste. Timor uh, I joined the project in 2016, and we, we divided the uh, block into three areas, A, B, and C, sub-blocks, and we advertised them internationally for um, farming partners. We were joined for blocks A and C by um, Timor Resources, um, an Australian company, 50-50 joint venture uh, with Timor Resources taking the operatorship. Uh, block B remains held exclusively by Timor Gap. And um, if anybody's interested in participating, I'm sure we would welcome you with open arms. Um, it, is, it is a prospective block. Um, so the present situation is that in March of this year, a rig arrived in Su Su Suai on a barge from Indonesia and drilling should have commenced in 
2020 uh, in in May of this year. Uh, it was very frustrating. We were finally getting, going to test these uh, ideas, but um, it's been delayed, and so we're now waiting for the drilling to start uh, anytime soon, as soon as we can get back into the area. So now I'm just going to go through and some really just some odd topics. Um, so firstly, to discuss how knowing about um, the uh, geology of the Indonesian man in Arcs has helped well, me at least actually, to, in particular, to sort of um, focus my mind on what I think is important for exploration in Timor Leste. So just going through these topics of exploration near seeps, and then a couple of discussions on the structural model. So exploration near seeps, as I say, in, in Saran, um, Bula, where they were, the drilling was based on that. Um, Osail, where there was uh, lots of seeps associated with these uh, deeper structures. And even in um, Lofin, there seems to be an oil seep at the surface above the gas discovery. So that's always been sort of played high in my mind. And the, the obvious area to me that we immediately attracted to was this near, near to Suai town. Um, where there are just so many surface indications of oil. There's the Matai seep up here, which we've already shown. This is where the four wells were drilled by Timor Oil, Matai 1 to 5, 1 to 4, which all find oil. Then when the people drill, oh, there's gas seeps as well, there's a burning gas seep down here, and a very small one up here. And um, But when people drill water well, they, they, they get very frustrated because they keep hitting oil well, which has obviously uh, pollutes the uh, drinking water. So Certainly, oil in the water here and oil in the water here. So, it's indicating this sort of area. This is right on the edge of the uh, Suai Basin. One other thing, as well, um, I'll talk about more later um, remote sensing anomalies associated with micro seepage. Um, there's a couple of anomalies that come up in this area as well. So, another indication of all the um, oil seepage in this area or hydrocarbon seepage in this area. Uh, this is one of the old seismic lines from Team Oil days running down through here. So the water well is here, and then this is the basal section down to the south and up onto the uh, northeast up in this direction. And you can see this low angle normal fault with these sediments coming down here. And there must be a pinch out in this area. We speculated anyway, you can't really see it very clearly. In this. So in 2018, one of these seismic lines was, shown, was shot through here. I can't show this seismic line, obviously, for a, a commercial reason, so it's not my, uh, um, but it shows beautifully a uh, uh, rather classic, well, a, a very well developed pinch out in this area. So this is the basis for Caral, but we'd already really predicted it before the seismic line, and this uh, just confirms the, the story of this. So this should be the well that would have been drilled in May. So we're waiting to drill this. Um, but that's a, is very much guided by the same principle of um, <coughs> drilling or, or at least exploring near, near to seeps. A lot of people say, oh, well, that's, that's the wrong policy. We shouldn't drill the seep areas because that's where it's all escaping and leaking away. Um, but it's, uh, based on Saram, it seems that that is where the oil uh, accumulations are likely to be as well. So this is just uh, almost a bit of academic work associated with that um, uh, pinch out. This is one of um, the classic in the 1980s they were doing sandbox modeling uh, extension. Um, this is a very obviously very steep extension. If, if you compare it with the team or it'd be a bit much uh, shallower extension, which would give you a much bigger pinch out. You see this pinch out here. Um, right on the basin margin, separated by this annual syncline, the axis coming down through here. Um, in Timor, this is a, you know, in the Suai area, this is actually a map redrawn from mapping, uh, seismic mapping they did from the 1969 program. This is Timor Oil's mapping. You see that they'd already defined this beautiful um, syncline in the basin, which, which is the equivalent of the hanging wall syncline. So this, gives the outer edge of the pinch out zone. And here's the seeps up here, so the pinch out zone is in here. Um, and unfortunately, they drilled this well, Matto 5, as I say. The Matto 1 to 4 
were up here, Matai 5 out here. Good idea to go out into the basin, but they went too far. They've, they've gone to the other side of the syncline, so somewhere up here, and all the oil is then just would continue to migrate up that way away from it. But here it gets pink and gets stuck in the pink chart. So this is again, this is this uh, syncline geology, the VKK formation, these turbidetic sandstones, and then the shallower marine sandstones above in the pink chart zone. You can imagine um, each sedimentary package would be the actual sediment would probably be shedding down the syncline and then it'd be lapping onto each margin. So each one of these sands would produce a pinch out up dip, and this is where we're hoping the oil in, um, in Caral well will be. Well. Okay, well, that's, that's shallow structures. There's all, obviously also the deeper structures, which are much more perhaps in the long term are, um, will give us bigger structures. This is just a very quick um, uh, sort of overview of what um, um, uh, the difference between thin skinned and thick skinned tectonics. Um, if you originally have an extensional continental margin, you have basement, you have pre rift uh, sediments, then you have syn rift sediments forming in these triangular basins as the, the extension on low angle normal faults. And then so you have pre rift, syn rift, and post rift. If you then collide, um, well, start thrusting or shortening on this. The first thing that will happen probably is you will just get thin skinned sediment which detaches it here um, and then stacks up these things here. This is like the, the Colbano group, thin skinned stuff that we saw in West Timor or the Neef group in East in, in Saram. Then below that you get these structures, including these anticlines, these inversion anticlines, where the base where the basement gets pushed back upwards, forming these anticlines in the what was the sin rift section. And that's what I think is well displayed here by this, this line from um, West Timor, offshore West Timor, the uh, thin skin cold belt over the top, and then the thick skin structure beneath it, the inversion anticline, and the similar in, um, in uh, interpreted below the coal barn area and in Osail. So in East Timor, Timor Leste, we've got this sort of structure, which I think is the clearest example of uh, inversion, very mild and affecting the basinal sediments um, on the seismic line. So pushing these back up, they probably too high just to be an extensional rollover, I think. So probably this is a little bit of gentle inversion. And certainly this Matai anticline up here seems to be an inversion anticline. This is quaternary reef lifted to 300 meters, just in this very two separate thing, pushing these up into an uh, There was a seismic line shuttle on here, but it hasn't really indicated any particular prospectivity yet. Uh, but those are the sort of structures with better seismic, I hope one day we'll be finding uh, inversion anticlines in the deeper subsurface. Last sort of structural topic I want to mention from, based on Saram, is, well, um, it's this, a, it's a, the, you remember the big overthrusting of the Kaniki formation. Um, and here we have a similar situation. Here is, this is uh, central Timor. Um, this is the I-22 anticline. And if you know your um, stratigraphy of Timor, you have the I-22 formation of Triassic Age, and then the Wailui formation of um, Jurassic Age. This is the I-22 anticline with the I-22 formation. And then this is the Wailuli or Bailuli Valley down here. So this is the type locality of the Jurassic rocks. The only trouble is, you can see the simple anticline structure. Um, so here, this purpley, you know, purple colored or the light purple um, is the I-22 and it's mainly dated as Norian region. So that's late, latest um, Triassic. The, the, the uh, samples indicated by the blue circles Whereas these samples down here are Carnian. So that's older, early, uh, early these are older rocks than, than these rocks. They're, they should be, these should be Jurassic. So it indicates that, the, in fact, rather than just simple stratigraphy, there's actually a thrust surface down here. And the holes uh, have been thrust over the um, uh, Triassic limestones. 
so older Triassic over younger Triassic. So you can imagine this, if this was still covered, could be prospective for fractured limestones, but obviously it isn't. Um, similarly, this basal anticline, um, uh, we're, we're standing here on Triassic limestones, and these are shale successions. I, we haven't dated this firmly yet, but I suspect that these may be older than, than these, and so probably thrust over the top. There's just off the picture down here, there's a gas, the gas seat. This is uh, you may people working in Jakarta will probably know Andy Livesey from Horizon, who was here teaching us how to collect our gas samples and having fun making little mini explosions from the bucket of gas that we collected. We, we turned the bu bucket upside down and then sucked gas samples into it. Um, this is the Galitas seat, which is one of the smaller ones compared with that other one we saw earlier. But you can imagine again, so this is a sort of an anticlinal structure here, and you can again imagine that this wasn't eroded out, then it would be another potential uh, trap below uh, ceiling shales, and the gases would be trapped in the crest of the anticline. So that's um, how um, uh, I said in the style what we're doing in TMLS. Now, sort of paying back some suggestions of. Um, how I think um, we, uh, what we've done in TMLS can help what you're looking for in the Indonesian manual. The first one is very obvious, really, and uh, I hardly need saying, but uh, as a primarily field geologist, I just want to emphasize how important field mapping is, real field mapping. T uh, the Banda arc is too complex to get good interpretations from just from studying remote satellite images. You've really got to get do the hard work, get on the ground and do the field work. This is a map of block A that we compiled, um, the Timor Gap team compiled. So that's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll list them out later. Um, but um, so this is our geological map of the Timor, uh, of block A. Um, this is, this was map was compiled at one to 100,000 scale, but the actual field work was done at one to 25,000 using the Indonesian Bakasurtadal uh, topographic maps, which are really good for base maps. I know that theoretically you don't need uh, topographic maps. You can do it all in arc view but, and uh, get hyper accurate maps. But what this does is it gives you much better appreciation of geological relationships, I think. This is just a, obviously a reduced version, but this is one of our map sheets, the Same sheet. So this is one to 25,000 scale mapping. Um, and it's, yeah, it really helps to, uh, you've got to have this sort of control if you're going to do serious um, mapping. We've got a site grid of seismic lines on here and you've got to tie that to the, to the geological one. Um, for instance, this area is a big, big dome structure picked up by this um, uh, area, a couple of Colbano group rocks. So yeah, obvious thing to say, but it's, um, Geological mapping is absolutely critical in this areas of this complexity. So having said how important work, field work and on the ground is, I'm now going to say how important satellite can be as well. Um, as you've seen from earlier maps, we have a lot of natural oil seeps in um, East Timor. And um, one of the good things about satellites with, with the right frequencies is that they can detect micro seeps. Macro seeps, obviously, are burning seeps or oils that you can collect in the ground, but you can also get areas of micro seeps where there's just little bits of gas coming out and they oil, they alter, well, particularly the clays, they alter it to kaolinite. Um, so we, we um, got CGG, um, we got CGG's um, uh, remote sensing group, MPA, to do a survey of the whole territory of um, Timor West for us. Uh, I, I can't show that obviously, but it's 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 beautiful. It really shows areas of seepage, um, which also we're going to tie it very closely to the uh, the wells that are being dri dri drilled because some of them have some of the prospects, drilling prospects have seeps, some of them don't. So it'll be interesting to see how those relate to each other after the drilling. Uh, but this is just I um I got my uh, got to have Mark broadly from um, CGG to um, just produce this map for me because this is an area 
this is the border of East and West Timor. So this is in West Timor. Um, and this is the alteration you can you can see from the image. Um, and you can just sort of speculate when you look at the Google Earth. Maybe there's some sort of anticlinal structure like that. So this is the sort of thing that I think you could pick out. Um, and so I would certainly recommend uh, using remote sensing to uh, at least locate where there is micro seepage. Um, another area is, which I haven't got to show, but is on the border with the Kursi. Of course, there's a big mud volcano right on the border. And again, that shows very nice micro seepage in that area. <coughs> Source rocks is another area that we've um, been working on. Again, not, not, uh, not telling you anything you don't already know the, the importance of these type of studies, but just saying how useful it's been for us in Timor. And uh, we've been working with Andy Livesey from Horizon in Jakarta. Um, and uh, oil and gas seems we could from across, uh, across the territory of Timor Leste. Um, it's like in, like in um, Saram, the seep seems to be Triassic, Jurassic type of age for the most part. Um, we do seem to have a particular group of seeps that are related to, um, that are sort of unique to the Suai area. And we can't find an equivalent um, source rock onshore. So maybe that's um, deriving from offshore. Um, and also, you may have seen from earlier talks I've given that with this, this basal anticline where we've got all these gas seeps down here. Now, this is exposed Triassic. So if, if the rocks, if the oil is originating in the, or the gas is originating in the Triassic, it obviously has almost no prospectivity. But if it's a, if it's coming from the core of the structure and it's Permian gas, for instance, then maybe you've got spill from a from a um, an anticlinal core of this anticline. So, so that's a and, and the gap and the, and the um, geochemistry has confirmed it is probably a deeper source. So there's a good chance that this is a prospective anticline, basal anticline, and uh, this is in our block C that uh, Timor Gap is still holding exclusively. Um, Let's say, well, I've only given a sort of very brief uh, discussion of what, what Andy in particular has found because he's been going to be giving a, a talk at the AAPG conference next year. So hopefully by then he'll have come to his final conclusions and uh, other interesting things will be coming out from, from that study of the source rocks in Timor Leste. Just a couple more topics to go now if you're uh, feeling the end, time to wrap up. Um, so this is the uh, uh, just discussing the age of man of sailor formation in team in Saram because you, you may have seen a few years ago that I wrote a paper with Han Van Gossel on the age of the man of sailor because the oil industry literature was reporting um, Jurassic ages for the man of sailor formation where it's pretty clear from outcrop that the dominant ages are actually uh, late Triassic normally meeting. Um, so we just sort of pointed out that they actually seem maybe this is the wrong age. Um, but since then, I've slightly changed my mind because in Timor, not my work with uh, David Haig in particular, the, his well, UWA group, University of Western Australia, has recognised two distinct types of limestone in the Lake Triassic. There's the Bandera Formation, which is the one that's rich in um, macro fossils. And so it would be the equivalent of the things seen at outcrop in Saram or collected at outcrop in Saram. And then there's also this, and that's um, late Triassic in age, but there's also a unit, the Perdido formation, which is mainly uh, early Jurassic in age. So maybe what we're seeing in Saram is the same in Timor, two different fasces equivalent to the uh, Bandera and the Perdido, and they're both sort of lumped together in the Man and Sabre formation. Okay, now this is my last topic of conversation of course my favorite because it um, um, discusses the allotment problem in Timor um, and but also I can make it relevant to petroleum exploration surprisingly. So this is a, a simplified geological map of um, this onshore of Timor Gap or the Timor West onshore block area with blocks A, B and C. Um, the type area of the Lola Toy metamorphic complex is mostly in block A, in the north of block A. And um, 
this is the core, along with the Lutus complex in West Timor, which is almost the same as the Lolotow complex. This is the core of what we've considered, or what has been considered, most people consider the Alokron, that is basement derived from the Bandar Art pre collision and thrust over the top of the Australian margin sequences. So this is, as I say, this is the, um, this is the uh, type area of it. So it's uh, most interesting in the relationships. Um, this is also shows in the red lines, a grid of seismic lines that's required by Pertamina and Mobile in 1994. Budi Priyasati, our um, Indonesian colleague in Timor Gap, managed to um, get hold of this old seismic data and um, Timor Resources had it re, uh, <laughs> reprocessed. Um, and um, so the, I'm just going to show a couple of lines on this. Firstly, this line here, and then later the, the second line at right angles, the, this dip line here down through Suai from near the um, uh, outcrop of the uh, Lolotoy complex. Now, Timor Resources and Timor Gap have come to entirely different uh, interpretations of this area. Timor resources are tending to follow the um, the, uh, uh, the Alokron model and so they see um, the Lolotow complex as an overthrust body on top, thrust onto the Australian margin and this is what they're interpreting. This is the uh, thrust contact and so they would see this is Lolotow complex thrust over Australian margin sediments. And they see a big anticline or antiform underneath this um, um, thrust sheet. And this is their Lafayette target. Um, so they, 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 they are planning to drill through here to test this big subthrust structure. Uh, in the Timor Gap onshore block team, we don't actually have any dedicated uh, interpreters. We haven't had enough seismic data yet up until recently. But so we um, asked the um, EMP team of um, Timor Gap parent company to interpret the seismic for us. And this is the set, this same line uh, interpreted rather differently. You see, they've got this red reflector, which is the top of the Lolotoy complex. You remember the Matai wells drilled into the Lolotoy complex here. So this is the top of the Lolotoy complex, almost parallel, but dipping downwards. Is this other reflector, which is equivalent of what they the Timor resources interpret as the thrust, but we interpret, or at least I interpret it based on the um, EMP team's mapping and uh, uh, picking. Uh, I interpret that as a mid crustal uh, extensional detachment, but within that is an, a detachment, a basement detachment within the Australian continental basement. Um, so, this is a couple of lines that shows it better on that other, other line showing this dipping down here in the way all these. Uh, normal faults detach into this, mostly detach into this horizon, this mid crustal detachment. So that's what I think this blue reflector is, where, rather than the overthrust that um, Timor Resources interpret. And interestingly, we had already published this one before um, they did this in, in, independent interpretation. This is our interpretation of the structure of the uh, Suai area, and you can see it very um, so with, the, with these basement extension faults interpreted the Lolotow complex as Australian continental margin, margin basement rather than as um, rather than as an overthrow sheet. And so just to run through this, just, just to sort of emphasize the what I think is the most important, most interesting part of the talk. So there's controversy over the Elopthan in Timor. So you either think of it as overthrust, um, Bandar Art, Bandar Four Art, the Elopthanus model, or I think of it as Australian upthrust, well, uplifted Australian basement. Um, if we think back, if we think back to um, uh, Saram, uh, the Audley Charles also interpreted Elopthan in, in Timor back in the main paper, or, sorry, back in. In Saram, Audley Charles interpreted a Lopthon in the 1979 paper, but even then, one of his co-authors, Subagio Chokro Saputra, uh, didn't agree with the interpretation. But anyway, Audley Charles uh, wrote the paper and he said he interpreted a Lopthon in uh, Saram 
but more recent work, uh, Palmer, one of the whole students, um, did a pretty detailed basement study of the metamorphic rocks, and I don't think he, he mentioned the possibility of a rock from there in that interpretation. So, uh, put on where the Lafayette well will be drilled. This will be one of the later wells in the upcoming drilling program. And this is what T1 Resources are doing, targeting this subthrust structure. But in contrast, this is what I think uh, they will, they will enter, um, uh, drilling through this, going from uh, medium grade metamorphic rocks into high grade metamorphic rocks. So, this is one of those rare occasions where I think we've, we've actually, the drill will decide for us. I, I personally am prepared to, you know, state my, what reputation I have on it, but um, I will go with the answer of this. If this is, uh, if this is, if this proves to be a great uh, oil, uh, successful oil well, and of course it's well drilled, well worth drilling despite its risk because it's a big structure. Um, but I, I would just say if, if this is, if this encounters Triassic or particularly encounters oil, I'll say, well, fair enough, well done, I got it wrong. But I hope. I hope the, <laughs> the other side will be equally up to accepting that if um, they'd end up in metamorphic basement, that this is a sort of a, a death of the uh, allotomous model. Um, so that's, yeah, well, that's uh, sort of staking my, the rest of my career. I'm in my 60s now, so I can just disappear and retire quietly. But um, I hope, well, well, I hope this well will settle with the team by drilling. So really, just as a just as a way of wrapping up now, um, this is a map I've produced a few years ago. Just sort of um, where I think there are, there are prospective structures could be in um, southern West Timor and offshore. These are all pretty much inversion lines I interpreted in this area. Series. I haven't got detail to go, time to go through all of these, but there's a good lot of large potential structures I recognise both in. ENI's block, if they still hold the block, I'm not sure, and in open areas to the west. And there's also, I haven't really looked at much at all, but just across the border from, uh, from well, from the Salai area, there's another basin. Um, I think I put the wrong name on there. Um, but uh, yes, I have, I put the wrong name on there. Um, but anyway, there's another, <laughs> there's another basin just up here, uh, which looks like a close analog of the, um, of the, uh, so I basin just across the border, and it has oil shows and it has mud volcanoes, so that would look a nice area for exploration as well. And as I put here, just as a final message, don't forget the prospectivity of the Tanamara and Kayo. There's lots of, well, fairly good indications for oil and gas there, and there's anticlines and whatever, so on. Um, yeah, that's, that's my sort of message. And just to finish with, with some acknowledgements, particularly to my. Uh, team of geologists that we work with. This is Dino Gandara, who I've been working with for probably 15 years now, uh, doing field work, having great fun. And more recently, Deborah Freitas and Maria Gutierrez, uh, who joined us as a field geologist and uh, done a great job with us. And we've had good fun uh, mapping out the uh, well, block A and block C, and we're now working on block B when we can get back to it. And also, the boss of the uh, onshore block, uh, MD uh, Norberto de Costa, who is also. Enjoy the fun. So this is us uh, sampling a gas seat from, from a shallow water in, 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 uh, in Eastern East Timor. And just to say thanks all, over all the years for all the people in Indonesia I've worked with, particularly in the old days, I used to spend a lot of time working with GRDC as it was then. Um, in Bandung and various oil companies here in Texas, Arco, both of course now incorporated into BP and then ENI and Hess and service companies, particularly Horizon. I say we're still doing lots of work with um, Andy Livesey and also uh, Alabama. Um, look at our man and fossils in particular. Yeah. And I think that's everything I've got to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you for spending your afternoon. Thank you very much, Tim, for your very interesting, comprehensive presentations. Yeah, we know Timor has a very complex geology, but it has a big potentials deeper in the subsurface.
Okay, uh, we already have a questioner here. And the first one is from Barca. Uh, you, you may say your uh, background and then uh, your name and then your question. Please, uh, Pak Barca, you can turn on your audio, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Gifan. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, sorry, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm Barca Manila Pai from, uh, I come from Alor, but I am uh, was born and stay in Kupang, West Timor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I need uh, many explanation about some sea page alongside uh, of pitch uh, on south to uh, south to southwest Alor Island and Alor, south of Alor. yeah. Uh, and south of uh, Panther Island, uh, I found uh, uh, we, we we found uh, some seepage of uh, oil, uh, gas, and uh, maybe asphalt uh, as in uh, in beach alongside of of beach mm -hmm. of Alor. Yeah, uh, I need you uh, many explanation about about it. Okay, uh, it's first. Yeah, it's first. Uh, second, uh, uh, what do you think about uh, uh, lacustrine deposit and uh, play of lacustrine in Timor? Well, the lacustrine. Uh, Sorry, carry on. Okay, Please. that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting to know that there are seeps in uh, Alo. Did you say Banda as well? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, I've, I have no explanation for that. I mean, there are, there are certainly um, Australian rocks and the thrusting alloy, um, whether, whether there's oil coming from there. Uh, more likely, I guess, it would be seepage from the um, the uh, wet out basin, the, um, the, uh, the pour out basin immediately offshore to the south <coughs> coast. Yeah, that seems most likely. Maybe, maybe that seems the most prospective, but I mean, Get the get the samples collected and get them analysed somewhere would be the answer and find out at least find out some something on the geochemistry whether they are whether firstly are, are they genuine oils or are they um and then if they're oils you know what are, what what age are they yeah you can you, you can find a lot from the geochemistry and I'm sure if you um I'm sure you can find somebody to sponsor uh, if you if you can't afford to get them analysed yourself show them to some oil company, I'm sure they would be happy to get them analysed for you. Uh, what was the second part of your question? Sorry, I forgot. Oh, lacustre. I don't think, well, I mean, there were reports, of, I did see uh, a poster at an IPA conference a few years ago of, was it Permian lacustrine rocks in um, West Timor? But yeah, so, yeah, I think I, so, yeah, the Permian lacustrine, yeah. yeah. But I'm afraid I, I don't know anything about those. I've, I've never seen the rocks and I haven't seen anything equivalent in West, in Timor Leste. So I haven't, I say, I haven't really studied the Permian at all. And, um, I think probably about two days field work on Permian rocks in Timor and up in the Colbana, in, the, in West Timor. And that was in the uh, Kekneno area rather. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything really useful to say on the Custrine source rocks in um, Timor. I don't think there's any, don't think any of the oils that have been analysed so far show a lacustrine signature, that's all I could really say. Okay, thank you, Pabarka, for the questions. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much, yeah. Tim, for your uh, discussion. You. And then uh, we can move to the next question from Pak Awang. Yeah. Thank you, Ricky. Hi, Tim. How are Hello. you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah. yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks for your presentation on uh, Banda Arc and especially on Timor. I have two questions. First, related to the mud volcanoes along the Banda Arc, and the second about the uh, Timor Leste yeah. offshore exploration. Yeah, the first question is on your slide, uh, you, you show the distributions of mud volcanoes along the Banda Arc, yeah? but uh, it doesn't look similar, the distributions. We have 
many mud volcanoes on West Timor, one or two mud volcanoes in uh, Timor Leste, yeah. many mud volcanoes in Tanimar NK, and now mud volcanoes on Seram. Uh, why there is uh, the, the difference on the distributions? Uh, in, in Timor Leste, in, in, in West Timor, the mud volcanoes also indicate the presence of oil and gas because uh, two years ago I I went with some gas or oil ships from the mud volcanoes. Uh, the question is in Tanimar and K because we have many volcanoes. Uh, our volcanoes there also indicate the presence of uh, petroleum. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, the the second question is. Mm, in, in, in onshore, we have uh, complicated structures because of uh, collisions with the uh, Australian continent. Um, in in uh, offshore, it is much simpler. Uh, what about the activities of uh, Timor Leste for uh, exploring uh, petroleum in offshore area, not, not in onshore? Do you have uh, any information about it? Thanks, oh, yes. Well, well, yeah, um, well, um, well, let's go with the mud volcanoes first. Um, my, I mean, obviously I've, you know, thought about it as well. My feeling is that, um, well, mud volcanoes are surface processes. And so I think it's partly a, uh, a level of erosion. That generally, Timor Leste is a little bit more deeply eroded. So there's less mud volcanoes. And the West Timor is still a lot more young cover. I mean, you see a lot more Triassic permian basement rocks or metamorphic rocks uh, in East Timor. So maybe just collision started a little earlier perhaps in East Timor, it's a little deeper, you know, more deeply eroded and, it, and you're seeing more oil seeps and gas seeps in Timor Leste because you're seeing more into the roots of the origin. Um, so which is obviously a bit negative because of your, um, your, your, you're getting down into your uh, reservoir rock. Whereas, I mean, that's positive for West Timor because it's all still in the subsurface. And similarly for Panama and Kay. Um, yeah, so that, that's how I'd interpret it. It's just, I mean, very broadly, only, only broadly. I'm not, not saying it's you know, definite, but in general, I would suggest that um, West Timor is slightly less deeply eroded than East Timor. And Panama and Kay, obviously, less and surround more deeply eroded as well. Um, uh, as to the offshore area, we have the Timor Gap have an offshore block. Um, <coughs> again, um, they've done 3D survey. They've got beautiful, huge um, prospects, um, and um, they're looking for partners. So um, again, if any anybody's interested, talk to my colleague uh, Dino Gandara, who's the uh, MD of the offshore block, as well as being senior geologist of the onshore project. So um, yeah, there's, there's, there's very well um, defined structures and uh, a, a, an active uh, PSC block in the offshore area on the north slope of the Timor Trough, obviously, mostly across the trough as well. Okay, okay. thank you, Tim. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we can, uh, thank you Pak Awang, we can move to the next question from, from Pak Sigit. Yeah, Pak Sigit, you can turn on your audio, please. Okay, terima kasih. Uh, thank you, Tim. Hi. I'm Sigit from Pertamina. Yeah, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yes, enjoy myself. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Very good uh, presentation, I think, then I have um, two questions. Um, first one is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you explained that there uh, to uh, oil with difference APA gravity, which is 44 and 21. And then I'm just curious, uh, is it uh, uh, related with probably difference of the facies in the Triassic Eurasic Saman Saman rock? And then maybe also uh, correlate with the, I mean, difference of the hydrocarbon window which probably we, we can find maybe in some area, there are a piece of uh, bigger structure there in, down in the East uh, Timor or maybe in West Timor. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, uh, if you mentioned before that, uh, there are allochthones and autochthones uh, in, 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 in Timor. 
then I just curious uh, um, if 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 we believe with the octotones, uh, which is uh, all the sediment coming from the uh, Australia, I think there is also some trap underneath the the, the Timor island and also offshore, but maybe uh, to find the uh, piece of trap, maybe we example the uh, ductility of the sediment, which is more detail, maybe we will find less structures, less structures, uh, structure, then maybe we can find some bigger uh, volume of the oil hydrocarbon there. I think that's uh, my questions. Thank you. Well, as I say, um, yeah, uh, it depends how much, you know, I'm, I'm not at all convinced that there is any significant, well, just very minor, uh, a lot of, I am not at all convinced that there's any lot of them to worry about. I think nearly all of Timor, for instance, and Saran as well, as I say, um, where there should also be a lot of them, um, I don't see any evidence for it. Or I don't, I'm not convinced by the evidence. For it. There is evidence for it, of course, but there's more evidence against it, I think. Um, and um, my, as I say, I think this is what we're going to be doing um, during this Lafayette prospect is not only looking for you know a very useful big oil resource but at the same time um testing i would say pretty pretty certainly um you know pretty, without any doubt that uh, whether there is a lot of i i just yeah um i i i, I don't uh, well, as I say, we'll just have to await the drilling results i may be right i may be wrong um so um I'm sorry, what was the question about the oil? The geochem oil geochemistry, I wasn't too clear on the, what you were Yeah, the first question is, uh, there are 44 and 21 degree APA in, in, the, in the oil, in the, in the so area right. there. Yeah. 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 It's related with the difference um, in the, within the Triassic, Jurassic, Saman, Saman, Sostro. Uh, well, um, as I say, uh, this is something that Andy Levesey is going to be talking about at the AAPG uh, conference in, next year. Um, he, he's obviously the expert on it. And, um, but it looked to me from his preliminary results um, that there's all, all the oils from the Suai area um, have a common source and they're, and they're um, different degrees of biodegradation, degradation, and alteration, and maturity levels. Um, but they have a they all originate from the same source, which is slightly distinct from other other oils in Timor and obviously in Saran. So um, yeah, I'm I'm not sufficiently expert. I, I think Andy was joining in. Perhaps you should ask him. He he's, he may be still connected on on the uh, LinkedIn on this. Um, but yeah, um, but yeah, essentially the oils are similar in. Timor and Saran, but they're also different, and obviously they're different. There are more differences between even within different areas of Timor, it seems. So, but uh, essentially they're all all related and all triassic as far as we know. Whereas the, some of the gases are definitely deeper, presumably Permian or Permian source. So maybe I don't know whether that would be the Lacustre Permian source that we were talking about earlier. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pasigit, for your question. Uh, next one is uh, from Mas Afif. Yeah, Mas Afif, you can turn on your audio, please. Thank you, Ricky. Yeah. Uh, hi, Tim. Uh, oh. Thank you for the very excellent talks and uh, very impressive one. I think it's quite uh, interesting to, to that. Uh, you what you call summarize very uh, comprehensive in terms of the uh, history of the exploration in this area <laughs> uh yeah most of the question uh, were already uh, asked in the for, for timor uh therefore i'd like to go to the north on the serum uh basically i have two questions uh maybe not questions more to the your impressions uh the first one is regarding lofin. Yeah. Uh, yes. 
it was reported that uh, there is oil seeps in the loving area, right? However, oh, none of, yeah, and then, however, none of oil was found in the well, both loving one and two, if I'm not mistaken. Instead, mm -hmm. uh, significant of gas and just minor condensate. So, if you don't mind, I'd like to have your impression on this. Uh, I mean, since most of the SIPs and hydrocarbon discoveries are oil in this area, I mean, uh, for instance, in the oil sale and, and Bula and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where does the, the oil goes in the, in, the, in the loving area? Are they migrated due to seal bridge? Uh, and the ga gas came later on? When you have a better uh, seal or preservation, something like that. Uh, what is the main contributor of the this this gas discovered in loving? Uh, whether it is controlled by the social type or maturity or complexity of migration or else. And the other one is uh, still in the serum, but uh, more to the offshore part. Uh, I think. We still have um, many questions in the onshore, but I'd like to have your impression on the offshore. What do you what do you think about the petroleum geology in the offshore serum? Whether this uh, manusela is still continue to the uh, to the offshore, or it, is it better to 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 uh, focus on the uh, cellular uh, target? I think uh, that's all for me. Very appreciate if you if you can share. Thank yeah, you. Um, I'm afraid uh, my answer to both is rather negative. But firstly, yeah, you, um, I, I need to say that I am a academic uh, geologist who's found my way into the oil industry almost by mistake. I never planned to. I never had any training in uh, oils and uh, where they come from. Uh, certainly, I mean, in general, for lofting, I mean, there's reported oil city but I have only found it from this one press release by this company Lion Energy um, um, and um, but in just made me a different um, Slightly, slightly different um, migration routes from slightly more mature or less mature source. I don't. I couldn't give a useful. Your own knowledge is far greater than mine on that sort of detail. And particularly, I have to say, um, and not in the offshore as well, because one of the problems is this data access. Um, I have hardly seen any recent uh, seismic lines across the Saram Trough, for instance. I mean. Yeah, the sort of academic lines uh, across the axis of the trough, but more, you know, the details offshore Bula. I mean, what, what I would say would be complete guesswork, really. I mean, I've, I've so much focused on Timor, and I'm very happy to sort of <laughs> express an opinion on different prospectivity of different areas of Timor, but. It's, uh, say it's the importance of this local knowledge. I mean, I know Saram would be much more difficult, but I mean, getting good map, you've got to have good geological control from mapping to uh, make any sense. And I know that's difficult in Saram. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say my, my opinion is pretty worthless on, on, <laughs> on, on those top topics, I'm afraid. But with the. Uh, uh, the history of um, exploration in this region so much is because I spent a lot of time unemployed and so I had plenty of time to look for these things. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky. Yeah, I think that that's, that's okay. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much, Tim. In my, in my very yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mas uh, The next one is from Pa Herman. Herman, please. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Tim, again. Um, as usual, uh, very interesting talk and, and um, 
inspiring. Um, then I still have a questions. Uh, but we come back to more about Kota Tashi. Yeah, so um, an old report indicating uh, use in limestone. Uh, but it's now, when I look at your diagram or your uh, section, seems like uh, a bit different than the old report. Is some, some changes, uh, something new? No. Can you please explain? Thank you. No, um, let me just find the cross section. It's a uh, Bobonaro Melange, and I know that there yeah. is a uh, Mobise, right? Oh, uh, here we are. Um, okay, um, so Kotatasi is down here. Do you see that's down there? It says D, down, down at this point here. Yeah. That's D for Dartolo, that's the Dartolo limestone. And then it's over that lane by ES, which is you seen shales. You see, there's a, if I, let me just zoom in on. Uh, can, I, can you see the screen, by the way? Yeah, um, yeah, okay. This is what I'm re referring to. Uh, yeah. So, you can here? you explain more about, yeah, this, uh, the limestone, yeah. um, is it a really a targeted um, reservoir in the area? Um. It's where I've seen it at outcrop, the Dartolo formation would be mostly fractured for the reservoir. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it can be a bit, well, it's fairly massive and it's well fractured. Um, there's, a, there's a nice outcrop. So, I mean, it is a genuine target and that was where the, where the main oil was recovered from in, in Coast Um But, it, but it, it's sitting directly on top of the Lolotoy complex and then Oil was also found lower down in that well, in um, fractures in the Lolotoy complex underneath. It's so it is a, a genuine reservoir target, but it's generally only a few tens of meters thick. It's not a not a very big. But the target is more like a secondary porosity, you think? Yes. yes. It's a fracture, then. Eh? Okay. I would think so. Yeah. From what okay. I see. Thank you, uh, Tim, for highlighting. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you, Herman. Uh, we will have uh, the last question from Jeff Malayholo. Yeah, this is the last question, yeah. Uh, Hi, Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Good to see you again. Good, good to see progress going on in uh, Timor-Leste with Tino. Uh, it's a oh, quick question. Can, can you tell us maybe a little bit uh, about prospectivity of KN Tanimbar and maybe a, some sort of general comment about other offshore blocks near Masela. Yeah, well, uh, as you know, I haven't worked there for a long time. I, I have actually thought recently that I, I really ought to um, write up because we did work for an oil company for Union, Texas back in the late 1980s. And um, I did write a paper in 1987, but then we did more food work. 1989. I never wrote that up, and I was thinking it was really time. I, I sort of just just to tidy things up. 30 years later, <laughs> get it on record at least, and so it doesn't go to waste. One of one of the things I'm doing in Timor is trying to get data out so that it, it doesn't just disappear when I when I die or when I retire. Um, and I should do the same with um Saram. I I oh, so sorry, not Saram. Kian Tanima. Um, yeah, I think I, th I think there's genuine prospectivity. Um, it would be quite hard work um, uh, to um, well, it would need obviously need seismic and uh, things. But yeah, I mean, terima kasih. So uh, um, as the offshore, I'm not re not sure what the recent blocks are. Um, I say, oh, okay, so then yeah. Um, well, that's more onto the other side of the other side of the system and um, mm. I have no, nothing useful to say on that. Uh, on, once you cross the front of the Timor trough, Tanimar trough, um, you've got to, uh, it's, it gets uh, gets away from me I'm afraid I'm I, um, and much more just seismic interpretation. Uh, I have nothing useful to say on the, the sale of rock for instance, I'm sorry to say. That's, that's right, it's useful to have your no thoughts on Ken Tanimbar. Uh, yeah, well, I, I would recommend them for more work, definitely. But uh, yeah, but, uh, 
30 years on. Yeah, it was a bit of fate than ever. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tim. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Tim, there is one last question uh, So, from, Bar from Pak Barka. This is, the, this is going to be the last question. Pak Barka. Okay, uh, okay thank you very much. Uh, uh, last question for uh, Tim. Uh, I need uh, some explanation about uh, rainfall, about uh, 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 about uh, linking Timor and Alor and Lebata and Flores. Uh, we uh, we know uh, if uh, earthquake uh, we feel the uh, the center uh, of earthquake in Flores Alor. But we feel in uh, uh, in Timor, and if uh, it center in uh, in the uh, in Alor in East Alor, we feel in uh, Atambua, Malacca, and some Kefas. Yeah. Uh, one case of, uh, in 2000 and 2011, uh, 11, uh, no, uh, 2000. 15, uh, one earthquake in uh, Lembata or Flores, uh, East Flores, uh, some mud volcano, a big, uh, big, erosion, uh, big eruption in Semau, uh, in Semau, oh, yes. and, and Poto, and Poto, the big, yeah. uh, big, big eruption. Yeah. Uh, uh, same same time, uh, earthquake in uh, Lembata. Yeah, in Lembata. I need your explanation about it. Uh, so uh, we need uh, uh, we need the uh, use the rainfall to uh, uh, mitigation the risk, uh, mud volcano risk in Timor. Uh, goes to uh, Kupang and Samau Island. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, um, it seems that mud volcanoes are very, or eruptions of mud volcanoes are very closely linked with uh, earthquakes. I'm never quite sure whether it's the mud volcanoes cause the earthquakes or the earthquakes cause the mud volcanoes. Presumably, the mud volcanoes cause the earthquake. Oh, sorry, the other way around. Presumably, the earthquakes then uh, shake up the mud and or shake up the uh, ground and produce the mud volcanoes. Uh, um, you know, particularly uh, Lucy in um, East Java as well, of course, was closely related to a um, uh, or initiated after a big earthquake. Um, uh, I don't really know much more I could say into um, earthquakes. Um, they're obviously uh, um, related to the uh, Ongoing collision and um, difficult to say precisely what's what's uh, um, related to the mud volcanoes. Um, as I say, big earthquakes followed by mud volcano eruptions. I think it's just the shaking really that causes the eruptions. Okay. I think that's the end of the discussion, yeah. Uh, thank you, Pak Barka, for the question, and then all uh, for participants, for all uh, that still staying in here. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, uh, for your kindness to sharing with us in InfoSea. We, we are very honored to have you. This is a very nice presentation, very excellent and comprehensive. So um, on behalf of Fossi, we would like to thank you very much for your uh, willingness to share this and stay safe. And that's for me, and I will give uh, to Melinda for closing. Yeah. Okay, Mas Ricky. Uh, thank you, Mas Ricky. And definitely to team, thank you very much. Uh, still the beginning, I contacted you, and you are very pleased to help us in sharing about this Timor. And hopefully we can uh, meet you in person, maybe in the future. Uh, nice to meet you virtually now. Stay safe, everyone. And uh, for all participants, I will let you to turn on your video and and give say hi to all of you. Yeah. 
And then we'll record this uh, video for YouTube later on. And maybe, Tim, you can see some of your college joining us as well. All right, maybe uh, that's all for, for me. Uh, maybe next week we will have another presentation on the Banda Arc, but we will talking about the Zircon, so about the dating in Banda Arc. Maybe uh, we'll support each other with today's presentation. And thank you very much for joining us today and enjoy your weekend, still Saturday night. Um, and see you again next week. Thank you very much and see you again. Thank, thank you. you very much, team. Thank see you, you again. Thank you very much. Great. I'm enjoying it.